Uh, the title of this panel is Left Perspectives on the Israel-Palestine Conflict. Uh, the panel prompt the panelists have been asked to respond to is as follows. How should the left understand the present crisis in Israel-Palestine and the Middle East, its origins and its historical meaning? What role has the left had in shaping these conditions, whether positively or negatively? Is there a left-wing alternative to the present escalation of bloodshed? If yes, what? If not, why not? What are the goals of the left in the broader Middle East? How do these relate to the tasks facing the left here? Which way forward for Palestinian liberation? So to introduce the panelists in the order in which they'll be speaking, first we have Bernard, who will be the speaker for the Sparsist League US. Next, we have Hassan, who is the co-chair of political education for Students for Justice in Palestine, Chicago, and a University of Chicago college student with interest in US imperialism, Iran, and Palestine. Next, we have W.J.T. Mitchell, who is the Gaylord Donnelly Distinguished Service Professor of English and Art History at the University of Chicago. He served as chair of the English department from 1988 to 1991, and has been an editor of the journal Critical Inquiry since 1978. His writings, his writings on Israel and Palestine include Eilis in Gaza, recently published in Counterpunch, Holy Landscape, Israel, Palestine, and the American Wilderness, published in Critical Inquiry in 1999, and Imperial Landscape, published in the book Landscape and Power in 1994. Last but not least, we have Rabbi Marilee Gordon, who has an undergraduate degree from Brandeis, Brandeis University in Near, Eastern, in Near Eastern and Judaic Studies, where she was involved in anti-war and leftist Jewish activities. She holds a Master of Arts from the University of Chicago and a rabbinic ordination from the Academy for Jewish Religion. In the 70s, she was a member of the political editorial collective of the Chicago Seed, the radical Jewish political collective Chutzpah, and the Chicago Women's Liberation Union. Most recently, she has been active with Torah, the rabbinic call for human rights, as well as the Illinois community for displaced immigrants. A year ago, she visited Palestine with a group of rabbis to meet with Israeli-Palestinian human rights groups. So the format of this panel will be that the panelists will be asked to give opening remarks of 10 to 12 minutes, followed by a series of short three to four minute responses. We will then open the floor to questions from the audience. So I'll tap two times once you reach the 10 minute mark, and then once you reach the 12 minute mark, I'll tap three times and continue tapping to indicate when your time's up. <laughs> so without further ado, uh, Bernard, uh, take it away, and you can use that microphone. Uh, and you can have to turn on first. Okay. Um, I'm Bernard from uh, Sparsons for U.S., the American section of the International Communist League. We've all watched in horror as the Israeli blitzkrieg rained fire and death on Gaza, murdering thousands, thousands of innocent women and children. Pro-Palestinian demonstrations here and around the world have been met with repression and a McCarthyite backlash. We say hands off all pro-Palestinian protesters, down with the Zionist state, down with US imperialism, and freedom for Palestine. These protests have been dominated by liberal outrage. American society is polarized. Either you are an anti-Semite Hamas supporter and a terrorist, or an anti-Palestinian Islamophobe genocide supporter. The task of revolutionaries is to break through this false polarization and put forward a revolutionary alternative that can liberate the Palestinians and advance the interests of workers and the oppressed. Palestinians face brutal national oppression and murder by the state of Israel. They have every right to defend themselves, including through force. The murder of Israeli citizens, civilians by Hamas and its allies is a heinous crime which is totally counterproductive for Palestinian liberation. Hamas's strategy plays into the place only to Israel's strengths. By targeting Israeli civilians, they drive Israelis behind Netanyahu's war effort and has only brought defeat and tens of thousands of deaths. To advance and win, the Palestinian liberation struggle needs a different road from everything on offer. As opposed to either directing the fight against the entire Jewish population in Israel or accepting cohabitation with the Zionist state, the key is to drive a wedge between the Israeli working people and their rulers, the Zionist state. This can't be done without recognizing the democratic right of Israeli Jewish people to live as a nation in Israel-Palestine. Only a Marxist military and political strategy 
based on understanding that the interrelated class and national conflicts cannot be resolved within the bounds of private property can achieve this. By contrast, the left and liberal Zionists push this false polarization as they cheerlead Hamas's jihad strategy as resistance, while pressuring the imperialists for a ceasefire. This is an obstacle to getting the Palestinian freedom, socialist revolution in the region, and destroying the Zionist state. There's a certain cynicism in the left's position. They know Hamas, Hamas won't win, yet remain silent out of empty liberal solidarity. This is bankrupt and despicable given the Palestinians' desperate need of a viable road to liberation. What's necessary is anti-imperialist struggle here in the US. The working class should take action to stop arms shipments to Israel. Strike action for, for Palestine liberation against the U.S. government would help, Palestine, would help Palestine a thousand times more than all the liberal and pacifist dissidents in rallies. The call for a ceasefire has been the central demand of all, all the dissidents in the rallies called by the liberals and the left. Well, now there's a ceasefire, and nothing has fundamentally changed in favor of Palestine liberation. Any ceasefire or peace deal brokered by the imperialists necessarily, necessarily reflects their interest, which is to maintain the Zionist state as their outpost in the Near East. All strategies which rely on the robbers of the world can only intensify the oppression of the Palestinians and lead to defeat. Looking to the imperialists to help Palestine is a dead end. Any struggle binding the struggles of the oppressed to the imperialists is a dead end. American workers manufacture and transport the weapons that are going to Israel. They have the power to stop arms going to, go, going to kill Palestinians. This is, a, this is a concrete way to fight for Palestine liberation and an attack on US imperialism in its backyard. But even such an elementary action comes up against the pro-capitalist leadership of the labor movement who only go who go only as far as their imperialist masters allow. There was a resolution recently for labor to stop arms production and transportation to Israel and for a ceasefire passed by the Olympia Washington Regional Labor Council of the AFL-CIO. The AFL-CIO pro-imperialist union bu bureaucrats quickly moved to reject this resolution as violating their principles. Liberal un union Democrats like those running the Chicago Teachers Union called for a ceasefire because it doesn't do anything to put them against US imperialism and is a cheap way of showing liberal solidarity. In reality, it's just a call for strengthening the Palestinian struggle through peaceful means. Many reformist groups are calling for labor action to stop armed shipments as part of the call for a ceasefire, that is, to mobilize labor on a totally, totally liberal basis. For labor action to be a real step forward, they have to be mobilized in opposition to pacifism and for Palestinian liberation. The fake left embraces these, these pro-capitalist treating and progressives like UAW President Sean Fain and Teamster Chief Sean O'Brien. Just as Biden was feeling the heat from massive protests against the genocide in Gaza, Fain came to Biden's rescue by calling off the UAW strike. And the day before Biden came to Chicago, where thousands protested Genocide Joe, Fain was glad-handing with Biden and Pritzker in Belvedere, Illinois. The same reformists backing the ceasefire resolutions in the unions and calling for labor to be mobilized on a liberal basis spent their time building the militant credentials of bureaucrats like Fain and O'Brien, who are either pro-imperialist or silent on Gaza. How can you call yourself a socialist or a fighter for Palestine liberation if you're not fighting, the labor, fighting in the labor movement for a leadership that will take concrete actions against imperialism? There will be no just peace as long as Palestinians are oppressed. And Palestinians will remain oppressed as long as the Zionist state exists. Only a revolutionary solution, that is the alliance of the Israeli working class with the Palestinian people against imperialism and its Zionist henchmen can bring lasting peace. That's what we in the Sparsus League fight for, in combat against all false dead ends that push the Palestinian people further into the arms of the Islamist reaction, while Jews are pushed deeper into the arms of Zionism. Those who want to fight for Palestine must drop all illusions in the imperialist governments and the UN, which has made clear where they stand. 
Recently, some students from this campus occupied the administration building to call for calling the university to, to divest from, from Israel. We defend these students, but the strategy, boycott, divestment, sanctions, is a dead end. BDS is posed as an international solidarity campaign calling on the imperialist butchers not to butcher. Reinforcing the subordination of workers in the imperialist countries to their own capitalist exploiters and their reformists and social democratic agents. It means diverting the masses who want to defend Palestine and fight for their own liberation away from a confrontation with imperialism and into embracing the imperialist government as potential allies. What is necessary is not liberal outrage or keeping our governments accountable to international law, which they always violate anyway. I remember, uh, we all remember it a lot. What's necessary is working class action against imperialism. What is the strategy of groups like the DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America? On this question, their main activity has been organizing protests with the liberal Jewish voice for peace for a ceasefire. Many of their ranks are horrified at what's happening and want to do something. Some of the DSA consider themselves communists even. even. But what can they do? They're, they're in an organization tied to Democrats who are committed to massive funding to Israel. All the opposition to AOC voting uh, to fund the Iron Dome that caused so much division in DSA is now totally dissipated. These Democratic politicians are now held up as fighters for the Palestinians, tying the struggle even more closely to the very party arming Israel's assault driving those who want to fight for Palestine into seeking an imperialist brokered peace. In Chicago, the DSA, along with the rest of the left, told everyone back in April, Brandon is better, and since have defended the Democratic mayor. We were unique on the left in saying, in, in saying to workers and the press that the workers and the press had no side in that election, and Johnson, that Johnson would betray labor black Chicago. How can you defend the Palestinians if you're in bed with Johnson? who threw pro-Palestinian demonstrators out of a city council meeting for opposing a pro-Zionist resolution. If the intervention of socialists at this crucial moment is not directed at making the union movement and the Palestinian, Palestinian movement revolutionary, at combating, at, at combating and replacing the pro-imperialist and liberal leaders of such movements with Marxists, then it ain't socialist. This poses the need for revolutionary leadership. Opposing Israel and supporting Palestine liberation is the red line for the ruling class that the pro-imperialist leaders and the workers' movement in the unions refuse to cross. Socialists have to win the workers', workers movement to the cause of Palestine liberation and for a fight with all supporters of the Zionist state and imperialism. Our task is to build an anti-imperialist pole against the current, le current leaders. We say no unity with the supporters of imperialism and the Zionist state. Such unity means unity with the murderers of Palestinians. More than 75 years of brutal history has completely intertwined the fates of Israeli Jews and Palestinians. The liberation of Palestine required the destruction of the Zionist state, the very foundations of Palestinian oppression. This is impossible without the liberation of the Israeli working class. The economic, democratic, and social advancement of Israeli workers, and even their continued existence in the Middle East, requires the end of Palestine's oppression. The imperialists support Israel, support Palestine oppression, as it is in, as it is in their interest to bolster the Zionist state, playing Jews against, against Jews against Muslims, Jews and Muslims against each other. An anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist struggle is necessary because a democratic solution that doesn't, dispossess, that doesn't dispossess either people requires expropriating the, prop, the private property of the Zionist ruling class. This strategy is rejected by the pan-Islamists and the nationalists. In line with the Arab rulers, they align with the exploiters of the Arab, Arab masses. And American and European workers, as well as Jewish workers, will never be won to a struggle waged against, will never be, never be won to, to a struggle waged under the Islamic banner and for the destruction of all Israelis. What is necessary is a strategy based not on international community of imperialists and regional capitalist rulers, 
but on mobilizing the international working class against all imperialist and capitalist powers. What's necessary is an alliance of workers and peasants throughout the Middle East to throw out U.S. imperialists and liberate the entire region. This, of course, includes Israeli Jewish workers who have no interest in continuing to be used as pawns for the U.S. Further, fighters for, fighters for Palestine must build the international front with American, British, French, and German work, working class organizations to stop arms shipments to Israel. This is the surest way to weaken imperialism and advance Palestinian liberation. This is the only banner worth mobilizing behind for victory, and that can break the movement from the cycle of reaction and defeat. Uh, thank you, Bernard. Uh, next, Hassan. How do I turn this on? Uh, the switch. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Hassan. Um, I was introduced uh, by Desmond as being uh, co-chair of political education for SJP Chicago, but I do want to um, emphasize that I'm not speaking on behalf of the organization. Uh, I'm giving my political analysis, and I'm not a, uh, an expert, uh, and I don't... Uh, I have, I have two main priorities being here, because this is a bit of a different crowd than uh, the crowd of the student protests. Um, one of them is to just bring home the urgency of what I think all leftists can agree on, which is that uh, genocide is unfolding in Gaza, and there is an opportunity uh, as a US citizen to apply pressure to uh, bring at least the current escalation to an end quicker than it would otherwise. And the other main uh, uh, reason I want to speak is to uh, emphasize what I think is uh, the importance of looking again at the history of the left in the Middle East concretely and understanding why it is that um, what uh, Bernard referred to as Islamic reaction um, or Hamas, why these are the um, militarily viable resistance parties that exist now, which is uh, not the most fortunate situation for, for the left, but we have to understand historically how that came to be. Um, okay. So I guess starting with what we can hopefully all agree on, maybe not, what's happening in Gaza right now is a genocide. Uh, Israel cut off food, water, and uh, uh, bombed humanitarian assistance immediately after October 7th. And uh, there were numerous statements by the fascist uh, Zionist government that uh, demonstrated genocidal intent, that uh, all Palestinians are human animals, that there are no innocents in Gaza, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what is our analysis of this? Um, I think first, it's important to understand that uh, this is part of a broader settler colonial project, uh, which currently, um, takes the form of an apartheid regime from the river to the sea. But it's also important that um, apartheid is not understood only in its definition under international law as a system of uh, institutionalized racial discrimination, but also in the terms that the South African Communist Party understood it, which is colonialism of a special type. So. Um, in South Africa, even after uh, formal political equality was granted between black and white people, which were not even at that stage in Palestine, uh, the political economic foundations of apartheid in terms of spatial segregation uh, still remained. 
So ultimately, uh, the liberation of Palestine doesn't come through simply legal equality between uh, Palestinians and Jewish people, although uh, I believe that a one-state solution is the only viable option at this point. There is, uh, in effect, one state that has control from the river to the sea, and that's the Israeli state. Um, and there's no way to uh, dismantle the settlements that uh, have hundreds of thousands of uh, Israeli settlers on them. <clears throat> so that infrastructure needs to be, uh, at least the, the, the formal um, political manifestation of apartheid, which has the most disgusting, egregious manifestations of like Jewish-only roads or military courts that uh, Palestinian children are subjected to, or military rule for Palestinians in the West Bank compared to civil law for Jewish Israelis, that needs to be dismantled. But that ultimately, <clears throat> as a leftist, I do recognize that that is not a full, that is not really a revolution. That's not the full revolution. But that is necessary. Uh, in the same way that a ceasefire is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Um, now, okay, Israel is, set, is a settler colonial state. Um, but that's not enough either. That's not a sufficient analysis either. Um, we have to understand the Zionist project in the context of imperialism. It's always been a project that has uh, existed in the context of imperialism. At first, by allying, allying itself with British imperialism, uh, the British mandate was what facilitated uh, the so-called Jewish homeland, uh, the homeland for the Jewish people, at the explicit rejection of political rights for Palestinians. Um, and that was the case through the, the British mandate, the, the colonial British mandate. And after the British mandate ended, uh, soon after that, uh, the U.S. became the key guarantor of Israel in the Middle East as a client state. So uh, we always have to understand Israel in the context of U.S. imperialism now, when we talk, whenever we talk about Israel. Which brings me to the next key point that we have to understand, which is what I'll spend some time on, which is that uh, this is not an Israel-Hamas war, which is the phrase that we hear thrown around a lot. And it's that it's not an Israel-Hamas war for some of the reasons that are more clear and are the critiques that are commonly made and some for reasons that are not commonly made. So first of all, it's not a war because we establish this is a genocide against uh, the defenseless, uh, largely defenseless civilian population of Gaza, which is constituted of 50% uh, children, refugees. Uh, so it's not a war because it's a genocide against Gaza, but it's also not a war against Hamas because it's not isolated to, the, the Israeli assault is not isolated to Gaza. But, uh, you know, we saw recently uh, Israel besieging hospitals in Jenin, murdering children in Jenin. Uh, the, the, the military and police presence in uh, Jerusalem is the highest it's ever been in history. Uh, and there's been a massive wave of detentions across Palestine, which have uh, led the, the prison population into unprecedented numbers, which, by the way, uh, was one of the conditions of Palestinian prisoners before October 7th was one of the cited reasons, in addition to the desecration of Al-Aqsa Mosque, for the Hamas attack. Uh, so the, the imprisonment of Palestinians across Palestine, the brutality of settlers in the West Bank, uh, ethnic cleansing in, in the occupied territories, ethnic cleansing in Jerusalem, uh, suppression of the political rights of Palestinians and um, also the few Israeli protesters within 48 um, all demonstrate that this is a war against Palestine, against all Palestinian resistance movements, not just Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the collection of resistance groups in the West Bank known as the Lions Den. These are all also explicit targets of Israel. And they have been, it's just that this is an unprecedented escalation since October 7th. So that's, that's one of the ways that this is not an Israel-Hamas war. But I think we also have to understand, because we're understanding this as uh, Israel always being in relation to U.S. imperialism, we have to understand this as a U.S. war. The U.S. is, uh, both parties have demonstrated, as they have throughout history, uh, that they stand unconditionally with Israel's uh, genocidal policy against the Palestinians. The Democrats and the Republicans have refused even the most basic uh, humanity. Uh, they, they've 
You know, they've allied themselves openly with fascists from the liberal end of the spectrum to the Republicans, um, which leads has led people into the the strange position of uh, uh, well, I won't get into that. Um, so it's a U.S. war. The U.S. is providing the guns. The U.S. is providing the bombs. The U.S. is providing the diplomatic cover, the vetoes. Um, but it's also um, we have to understand the the position of U.S. imperialism in the broader Middle East. So for one thing. Uh, Israel is um, bombing South Lebanon also. So uh, Hezbollah is also a part, a part of this um, war. And um, as is um, the few groups in Syria, so I mean Israel is also allowed to bomb uh, Damascus airport under US cover. Um, the Houthi rebels uh, in Yemen who've sent missiles their missiles that are um, targeting Israel are being intercepted by U.S. warships, um, and the the. That's three minutes. Uh, ten. Uh, you have two more minutes. I have two more minutes. Okay. Um, okay. The 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 few uh, militias, the Shia militias within Iraq, uh, that are um, supported by Iran. The, that are under the Popular Mobilization Front are also being targeted by U.S. strikes in direct connection to this uh, escalation against Gaza. So many of these um, have, uh, have the characteristic of being um, Shia groups, groups that are backed by Iran, and they're the, the main, uh, and Hamas also is, is allied with Iran. These all have the characteristic of being um, backed by the Iranian government. So I think what the main question for leftists is, you know, how did it come about that Hezbollah became the effective military resistance in the south of Lebanon? That wasn't always the case. This is a development after 1967. Uh, there was actually a very strong Lebanese Communist Party. And this is one of the things I would like to say is there are third worldist um, Marxists in the Middle East that need to be read now. Mahdi Ahmad, the, the uh, head of the Lebanese Communist Party, had an analysis of colonialism and imperialism. Uh, Ghassan Kanafani, one of the leading Marxists in the Palestinian resistance movement. Uh, had analyses that dealt with the issues of class and other issues that are particular to understanding the Middle East in a very sophisticated way. Um, but after the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982 and the Iranian Revolution, that's that's the situation where the left became eclipsed by these um, other movements. Um, so I think it's wrong to group all the Islamic resistance movements as um, reaction in a simple way. It's clear that Iran's anti-imperialism uh, against the United States is, is, is very contestable. For one thing, the Iranian government itself is uh, racked by a protest movement, but I think it's uh, ambiguous. We have to deal with the fact that the protest movement itself in Iran is not a leftist, uh, uh, leftist movement, although it's progressive. And the Iranian government itself uh, is actually a force that is backing groups that are standing in the way of U.S. imperialism. So that's a key dilemma that leftists have to deal with in the sense of uh, building effective bases for resistance um, to U.S. Uh, imperialism and Zionist colonialism. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan. Uh, next, uh, Professor Mitchell. So, uh, I'd like to associate myself with Hassan's remarks, which I think are very much to the point that this is, uh, whatever the left is, and I'm, I'm not here to tell you uh, what it is or to represent any leftist organization, uh, th this is an extraordinarily complex uh, situation. And some of the things you've just said, I really I want to associate myself with them, particularly the complicated role of Iran and also the, the role of Hamas uh, which uh, strikes me as in need of some very careful thinking through. So far, it has simply been labeled a terrorist organization, uh, which fails to acknowledge that it is also a political organization uh, that cannot be wiped out by military force. Uh, its leaders are not in Gaza. Uh, of course, they can always be assassinated. And it might be the case that Hamas will suffer the fate uh, that the PLO did, uh, 
when they were uh, driven from one from Lebanon to Syria uh, to Jordan uh, until they finally were brought in as basically an occupation government uh, for the Palestinians. This is why I think the PLO uh, and the Palestinian Authority uh, is now being talked about as oh, this will be the diplomatic answer. Uh, Tom Friedman's editorial in the Times today says we have to prop up the Palestinian Authority and make it the, uh, the government. Um, one thing I think that gets lost in much of the discussion is the fundamental notion that maybe the Palestinians ought to be consulted about what they want. Uh, Self-determination to me is the foundational uh, issue. The Palestinians, we need to find out what they want. Uh, that's why, uh, Bernard, I'm a little uneasy with, uh, you're saying that the uh, Israeli working class is gonna rise up against their Zionist masters. I think that's, if you checked with the uh, working class of Israel, the Jewish working class, and maybe even the Palestinian working class that are uh, nominally citizens, second class citizens in Israel, you would probably find uh, that they uh, want no part of smashing their state. My bottom line in all of this is, I believe uh, Israel has a right to exist, but I do not believe it has a right to prevent other people from existing. Uh, we have been saying for 75 years that it's time for the Palestinians to have self-determination, to have a state. Uh, a political structure in which they can pursue their own goals. If there were, uh, all the polls suggest right now that if there was an election uh, that, that brought the citizens of uh, the West Bank and Gaza together, Hamas would win hands, to, hands down. Uh, that the Palestinian Authority is so discredited for its corruption. Uh, so this is why self-determination brings with it a risk that one might have to contemplate a solution that, of the sort that occurred in Ireland. Uh, I see many parallels between Hamas and, and the Irish Republican Army, which was a terrorist organization. Uh, also remember James Madison was a terrorist. Uh, I'm so sick and tired of hearing the word terror thrown around as if it designated uh, some kind of real thing liberation movements have always been designated as terrorists by those in power, those in authority, the, those who are controlling colonization uh, and the exploitation of people who are weaker than us. Uh, Native Americans were, uh, were terrorists too and you might uh, think back to the fact that thank our Thanksgiving holiday <laughs> is uh, also for some people in this country at this moment uh, a commemoration of the Nakba of the 18th century in this country when we began driving Indians from their land. So very, very long, complicated struggle. Uh, my role in this um, has been as a Gastarbeiter. I've been invited to Palestine and Israel many times to speak about uh, the literary, artistic subjects. I know a lot of Palestinian and Israeli artists, and uh, one of the great coalitions I've been uh, part of is the attempt to bring those artistic communities together because they seem often able to imagine things. For instance, interventions at the wall, which is uh, a great place for painting. Uh, so figures like Mike Banksy and many Palestinian of artists have done wonderful things with that wall. Um, I've been going to Israel and Palestine since 1970, which I imagine is many of you weren't born. Uh, and I, I just want to tell you a story about our first visit because uh, it'll give you a sense of how something essential was revealed in the first uh, I think meal that we shared with a Jewish and Israeli family. Uh, my wife's best friend had just moved there and married uh, a, a Libyan Jew who had just emigrated 
to, uh, to Israel and who was uh, in Mossad, in the Secret Service. Uh, Judy was holding forth on how the Arabs all want to kill us. They, they're anti-Semitic, they hate us Jews. And Benny, her husband, said, Judy, uh, you know, you're crazy. It's the, the Europeans who want to kill the Jews. The Arabs have never uh, <laughs> conducted pogroms against us. Uh, the, the reason they want to kill us is not because we're Jewish, it's because we've taken their land and we're not going to give it back. I have a kind of clarity in that moment. Uh, Benny, working for the security services of Israel, at the same time had a very clear and realistic sense uh, of what was going on. Uh, I've been back numerous other occasions, and I just thought I would mention three or four because they are at times when I felt I learned something new. Uh, 1987, my 12 year old son and I uh, were invited to uh, visit. Uh, I was to give uh, the keynote address at a conference at Bar Ilan University, the most right wing conservative university in Israel. Uh, the topic was landscape artifact text. And I wrote a talk for it uh, called Imperial Landscape, which included many of the photographs of Gene Moore. Uh, that Edward Said wrote about in his uh, classic photo text, uh, After the Last Sky. That, uh, that conference, uh, my, my talk was entitled Imperial Landscape, full stop. It was about the fetishization of land, the way the holy land has been uh, turned into uh, a pretext for murder, genocide, uh, ethnic cleansing. Uh, I don't know if it's genocide yet in Gaza. I think it certainly, most certainly is ethnic cleansing. And if it goes on, if they start it up again, then you can say, since the refugees are now doubly or triply refugees, they have no place to go. So the only point in further uh, murder of thousands of people is simply that. It is not to move them anywhere. So. It moves from ethnic cleansing to genocide. Needless to say, Bar Ilan University wasn't very happy with my talk, but the Israeli left ro rose to my defense. And so in 1998, the Palestinians decided to hold a similar uh, conference at Birzeit University. Uh, that's when I wrote Holy Landscape, uh, which is about the role of religion and the way American Zionism is a key element, a key ideological element. Uh, if you ask yourself, why is the United States so invested uh, in Israel? Why, why are they our client state? Um, and it has something to do with uh, white um, American Protestant nationalism, which regards the fate of Israel as closely tied to uh, the, the fate of Palestine and of Israel. As you know, the end times are approaching, and uh, the paper bridge across the Valley of Jezreel. Uh, the, the Jews will get to march to heaven and the Christians and uh, the Muslims will all be burned up in the final rapture. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about the man now who is the, the uh, head of the Republican Party in our Congress, this guy Mike Johnson. This is what he believes. So there are deep ideological issues here uh, that, that go beyond any kind of imperial self-interest. It's, uh, it's an extremely toxic uh, thing. Last thing I want to mention was, um, well, two things. One was Edward Said's memorial in 2003, which I went to, uh, which was postponed repeatedly uh, because in 2003, you might remember, that was the second intifada. And uh, uh, in 1987, that was the first as luck would have it, my son and I were caught up in, uh, in that uh, intifada in November of, uh, of 1987. Uh, my last visit was in uh, 2017, and this was to Birzeit University and to the uh, Art Academy of Palestine in Ramallah. And there I, again, met with artists. It, uh, it became clear to me then that it was getting harder and harder to bring artists 
from, uh, from both sides together, as had been possible previously, that the situation in that sense was, was really getting worse. Uh, and it was also the moment when BDS was making a very uh, big push for um, American liberals, leftists, to, to sign up to the boycott, which I did. Uh, the Palestinians said, thank you, Tom, that's, uh, that's uh, great you did that. The Israelis, uh, my friends there, were alarmed. I can tell you, if any of you are thinking about joining BDS, think twice. If I had it to do over again, uh, I would not do it. Not because it's man, basic, who cares if I'm boycotting Israel? I'm a professor at University of Chicago, big deal. Uh, the, the problem is uh, signing up for BDS the immediate reaction was I got turned into the professor of terror and my picture was plastered all over this campus by a guy named David Horowitz who uh, uh, labeled me and about 20 students as uh, advocates of terror. This is for joining a nonviolent protest called Boycott, Divest, Sanction. The, the basically uh, Martin Luther King's uh, strategy has now been labeled as terrorism. Another reason why I think that word has to be uh, completely debunked. But worse than, much worse than that, I, my, the, the, the poster was kind of uh, made me notorious, I guess. The, much worse is, now I can't go back. I can't go back to see my Palestinian friends or my Israeli friends. Mm -hmm. So uh, signing up for the boycott means you'll never get past uh, the uh, immigration uh, to, to visit. And that to me, is, it's sad. I'm, elderly man, I'll never get to go back to a place with people I love a great deal and who I've uh, hoped for peace for a very long time and justice, but we'll see. Thank you, Professor Mitchell. Uh, boss of my face, uh, Marilyn Gordon. In 1971, seven, us, seven of us with strong political interests met and decided to start a radical Jewish journal. Each of us had been very active in the anti-war movement, and each of us had lived in communes and identified with the counterculture values of cooperation, skill sharing, and community building. Each of us had examined sex roles in a personal and political way and brought to the group some understanding of feminism, gay liberation, and more open role choices. Each of us was anti-capitalist. Half were from working class homes. All of us were working, teachers, daycare staff, taxi drivers, and social workers. We viewed the war, racism, sexism, and competitiveness as integral parts of capitalism. And each of us had been in leftist groups where we had grown furious at expressions of total support for Arab states and Palestinian guerrillas in their call for Israel's destruction. Reluctantly, we realized that many leftists we had worked with closely showed no awareness of Jewish oppression and no concern for Jewish survival. We realized that this was anti-Semitism and decided to fight it. We would oppose persecution of Jews and work for the survival, self-determination, and cultural flowering of our people. We would maintain the best values and skills of the left and the counterculture. And that was chutzpah. Chutzpah is a, a Yiddish word that means nerve, you've got a lot of nerve in that sense. And that's what we call our journal. This is an anthology from the journal. The 1971 debut issue stated, Israel is important to us. We feel strong ties to the people of Israel and oppose any group which urges that the Jews be driven into the sea. At the same time, we are aware of many problems with Israel. Internally, there is discrimination against dark-skinned Jews and against Arabs. 
in terms of relations with other people, Israel doesn't face up to the needs of the Palestinian Arabs and their rights to self-determination. At the same time, the Palestinian Arab organizations and the Arab nations don't face up to the needs of the Jews. Israel's military security is based on weapons from the United States, States, which is just making a power play in the Middle East and cares no more about the lives of Jews or Arabs than it cares for the Vietnamese. This was 1971. Real security for Israel will come only with a settlement which recognizes the oppression of the Jews and the Palestinians and realizes that each group has the right of self-determination. The fact that most talk about peace in the Middle East is jammed between blueprints for bigger and better weapons and lectures about why the Jews and Arabs have to be enemies is all the more reason why we have to encourage a real search for peace. Our journal was published two or three times a year with articles on gay liberation, anti-Semitism, socialism, the war in Vietnam, fascism in Argentina, two peoples, two states, feminism, Jewish culture, Jewish resistance to the Nazis in World War II, and Israel singled out by the UN for defying arms embargo to South Africa. We recognized anti-Semitism on an international level. And here's an example. To single, out, to single out Israel as the one country to be condemned for racism due to arms sales to South Africa is clearly a racist act in and of itself. All countries that break the arms embargo with South Africa must be condemned. Some argue that because black Africa turned its back on Israel, Israel should seek allies wherever it can. We disagree. We oppose black Africa's blind support of the Arabs. Nevertheless, this is no excuse for any arms trade between Israel and South Africa. Israel's complicity with the racist, fascist South African government is a violation of the egalitarian principles on which the state of Israel was founded. The UN Committee Against Apartheid's condemnation of Israel alone is a violation of the humanitarian anti-genocidal principles on which the committee and the United Nations itself were founded. Neither can be justified. This was the balance. This was the tightrope that we walked. We went on to produce a supplement to the paper Israel and the Palestinian Arabs that gave historical and ideological support for a peace settlement. This was in 1975. Based on the continued existence of a secure Jewish Israel and the creation beside it of an independent Palestinian Arab state with provisions for non-aggression. In an article, The Way to Peace, Two Peoples, Two States, Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Skeist, represented the views of the political collective as, we believe that the only hope for peace in the Middle East lies in, one, guarantees for a secure existence for the state of Israel as a Jewish homeland, and two, the creation of an independent state as a Palestinian Arab homeland. Right now, this is in 1975, this proposal is unacceptable to both the Israeli government and the PLO but minority voices within Israel and to a lesser extent within the PLO are considering this two-state approach. The collective disbanded in 1982 with pressing work and family obligations and less support for a socialist Jewish perspective. We went on individually to be involved in Americans for Peace Now, New Jewish Agenda, Agenda, J Street, and other organizations on the Jewish left. I came across an article, a book review, in another socialist Jewish publication, Response, from 1973, analyzing the new left's inability to parse 
the Arab is the Arab Israeli due to anti-Semitism, and reviews three books by Jewish Marxists on the issue. One is Stalinist, one is an ex-member of the French Communist Party, and one is a socialist Zionist. Their disparate views, according to the reviewer, provide a basis for a balanced analysis grounded in Marxist methodology of the tragic dilemma in the Middle East. Is that helpful in understanding the current situation? Maybe not. One of our core political analysts in the collective, a Jewish carpenter no less, wrote the following, and you tell me when he wrote it. I am feeling less and less like an idealist more interested in the here and now, not academic conjectures. Israel is a state with a government that makes many decisions. It often does things I disagree with. Some of its leaders really suck. It has a right to suck as much as other governments do. I disagree with a lot of what they did in Gaza. If I was in charge, I think, do the first bombing and then stop. Point made. Can't win a guerrilla war in a densely populated area. And what would winning mean anyway? But Hamas has shown no interest in peace and settling for a two-state solution. And Hamas had been shooting hundreds or some claim up to a thousand rockets into Israel. What state in the world would put up with that? What is Israel's obligation to the land and people it formerly occupied? To feed it, provide it with fuel, employ its population, all this while Hamas has shown it is really interested in a one-state solution, a fundamentalist Islamic state. It sort of amazes me how Hamas has played the Jewish and Christian guilt card given their professed Islamic politics. I know how this sounds, but I still consider myself a leftist who wants self-determination and a Palestinian state. I also remember arguing 30 years ago for such a solution and clearly saying to those who talked about how small and vulnerable Israel would be, that if Israel was attacked by artillery, the tech then, from Gaza and the West Bank, that Israel could fight back and there would be an address to mail that military response to. I don't like seeing children and innocent civilians hurt. I don't want to see Palestinians starve, but I also see how Hamas has used all this to influence the West. This was written by Myron Perlman, may his memory be a blessing, in 2009. What has changed since then? Yeah, I'd argue things have changed, they've gotten worse. Personally, my politics are pretty simplistic. I consider myself to be far left, but as a moral stance, that is. I'm not part of a political party. To me, to be far left is, support, is to support human rights for all humans. When I preach as a rabbi, I return again and again to these core teachings, and you don't have to believe in any God for these to be core teachings. This is from a hundred before the common era. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? If I'm only for myself, what am I? The corollary to that is, if not now, when? Don't sit on your tuchus, it's time to act. Each human being is created in God's image. This is a fundamental Jewish teaching each human being. Therefore, each is entitled to dignity and respect. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the stranger as yourself. And the experience of being oppressed means you have the obligation to relieve the oppression of others, for you were slaves in the land of Egypt, said over and over again in the five books of Moses. The only glimmer of hope I have witnessed are on a grassroots level, such as those I experienced on a week-long visit to Palestine a year ago 
with 18 other American rabbis. For instance, an organization called Zohrot Remembrances that is trying to bring Israeli Jews to recognize and acknowledge the sites that used to be Arab villages that were wiped out in the Nakba, such as Combatants for Peace, a volunteer organization of ex-combatant Israelis and Palestinians who've laid down their weapons and rejected all means of violence. The parent circle of Israeli and Palestinian parents who have lost children to violence from the other side. Om Dean Biyachat standing together. Sally Ebbett, an Israeli-Palestinian, um, it, they, they wor they're working on building a shared home for all those who refuse hatred and choose empathy. This is just a few of the organizations that we met with. And to my mind, the only way that I see forward at this time is to develop relationships, to work on a grassroots level, and to recognize the pain and the human rights of the other. Thank you, Natalie. Now we'll move on to the response section of our panel. Um, originally, it was meant to be three to four minutes, but I think to get to the Q&A faster, it might keep it to two to three minute responses. Uh, yes, uh, in the same order in which you initially spoke. Uh, so I'll tap twice at two minutes, and then I'll tap three times at three minutes. Um, How much time do you have? Oh, um, for responses, two to three minutes, but we move on to Q&A after that. Uh, so Bernard, would you like to start? Yeah, to uh, Professor Mitchell, I think your arguments uh, about the Israeli working class not, won't, will never rise up, would be more convincing if the Israeli working class did in fact not rise up, go on strikes, even general strikes sometimes. You would have a better argument if that didn't happen. Um, if, which would argue that there's no contradiction, that the only capitalist class society that exists in the world, there's no contradiction between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie is Israel because they're Jewish or something? I, it's, it makes no sense. Uh, the point being is that uh, that struggle of the Israeli working class has to be brought much the same way as Lenin and Trotsky's Bolsheviks explained to the American Communist Party, in, it, ex, explained to the American Communist Party that they were in fact not communist. They would not be communist until they took up the struggle against black oppression. Similarly, in Israel, the Israeli working class would not be revolutionary, would have no, no chance of winning its gains, maintaining its gains, without the fight for Palestinian freedom. Um, the question as to what happened to the communist, uh, the different Stalinists and different groups that uh, uh, were active, and then actually uh, their their, their positioning uh, ebbed uh, in the face of the, uh, the Pax Americana Arab nationalist and then Islamicist. That has to do with the false strategy they had. They did not have the strategy that was taught by Lenin and Trotsky's common term that we all have to learn that communists seek to lead, to lead the, the, the national liberation struggle. In those instances, these Marxist parties, the Marxist parties let the nationalists lead, in fact, politically subordinated themselves and their working class base to the nationalists. And even the case of Iran, uh, to the Islamists. We thought it was a great thing uh, for Iran to rise up against uh, US imperialism. U.S. imperialism had dogged Iran for decades. Um, but what was necessary was for revolutionary communist leadership of the national liberation struggle against U.S. imperialism. And uh, that kind of explains what happened to the, uh, to the left, why it, was, why it is not hegemonic, why the other forces, because they capitulated to these other forces and didn't uh, see the necessity of carrying out uh, the, uh, 
the communist policy of the communist workers' movement leading the struggle for national liberation. Okay. Uh, in principle, I agree that the Israeli working class also needs to be fighting for Palestinian liberation. However, if we look at the current situation, even with the protest movement that the Israelis had against Netanyahu, the supposedly pro-democracy protest movement, the question of apartheid was never on the table. The question of ending the siege on Gaza was never on the table. So there's a lot of work to be done in that direction, and I don't think that's the correct um, line to take at this time. With regard to the analysis of the failure of the left being that the only leftist parties in the Middle East history were Stalinist, or that they weren't Marxist-Leninist, or that they adopted the, the incorrect strategy, I think that's um, incorrect because it doesn't uh, address historical or material factors in a real way. It doesn't address social history. That's an ideological analysis. Um, there were many, actually, Marxist-Leninist parties. I mentioned the Lebanese Communist Party. The Lebanese Communist Party was one of the two effective parties that was able to resist the Israeli invasion of 1982, along with Hezbollah. Uh, uh, and many of the leaders of the Lebanese Communist Party were actually Shia. They were from a Shia background, from the south of Lebanon. Um, the Iranian Communist, pa the Communist Party in Iran, the two-day party, was, uh, had more of a Stalinist orientation. Uh, but, the, uh, but on the other hand, there were also uh, Marxist parties uh, contributing to the Iranian revolution, like uh, Fedayin uh, uh, the also the Mojahedin Akhal, which are not easily um, understood just simply in terms of Western Marxist terms. They were actually very complicated and have to be understood in, in, this, in the context of guerrilla warfare and Maoist movements at that period. So I don't think these can be just like simply dismissed without a historical understanding of them. Um, with regard to um, Mary Lee's uh, remarks, I would just ask whether you um, acknowledge uh, international law, and if you do, if you acknowledge that uh, the Gaza Strip and the West Bank are under military occupation, uh, and that the State of Israel, uh, as dear as it may be to you, uh, was founded on the ethnic cleansing and expulsion of 750,000 Palestinians, and they have the right to return. Uh, and uh, I guess I'm out of time. You still have 40 seconds. Okay, I do, I thought you'd not, sorry. Uh, with regard to Professor Mitchell's remarks, um, I'm trying to remember some of the points made. Um, I mean, I think it's true. It is, it is heartbreaking that you can't return to Palestine after taking the BDS stance. Um, however, uh, Palestinian students and Palestinian academics face extreme, extreme re repercussions that are, that are much more than anything that anybody in the U.S. would face for taking BDS stance. And so I think the principled stance is an all of the above strategy, which includes BDS, includes labor strikes, uh, includes uh, general anti-imperialism that re recognizes the U.S.'s role uh, in, in uh, plundering oil in Syria, in uh, uh, collectively punishing the Iranian population with sanctions, uh, in destroying the country of Iraq uh, in violation of international law. So, yeah. Thank you, Hassan. The next, uh, Professor Mitchell. Yeah, I'm not sure I want to go back to Lenin and Stalin as guides for my th thinking today. Uh, the, I think Hamas was guided by Bakunin, and what they did was what we call propaganda of the deed. Uh, and I think it was uh, th the greatest shock that Israel has endured since its founding. Uh, and that's why it looks as if they are going to launch a second Nakba in, in retaliation. Uh, so the bad gets worse. Uh, Hassan, I, you know, I, I hope I didn't sound like I was whining because I can't go back uh, to see my friends in Palestine. Uh, I, I totally uh, to take your point. Uh, I, uh, it was a very personal kind of confession that it's just, it's, uh, after all these years of being involved in this, it, it felt like a tactical mistake on my part, and I just wanted to admit to it. If I had been thinking clearly, I wouldn't have done it. Uh, Mary Lee, we're the same generation. Uh, in fact, uh, we could have joined your, your group, I think, that we were involved in all the same things. Uh, so 
part of my sense of the left is uh, a kind of aching nostalgia for that time when we thought uh, politics, uh, social relations, sexual relations, the whole thing uh, could be rethought. Now, you know, it, what is the left now? Um, at a time when it's certainly not in the ascendancy, I don't see uh, uh, anything but the potential of coalitions of various kinds among uh, people who are going to disagree at many levels. That is, I don't see any uh, politically correct line that can guide us through this. It's going to have to be improvised, uh, made up on the fly. And that is going to lead us into great moments of uncertainty. But it does strike me that the whole framework for this event, the reason we're gathered around this thing is uh, we've known now for 20, 30 years that the danger to this planet is, is imminent. Uh, 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 up until October, I thought 2023 would be recognized as the year when climate change was no longer in the future, when it was an absolutely present, dire situation. And so, of course, a second war had to break out. Um, I do think, I hope in the discussion, we will talk further <coughs> about what kind of steps uh, might be taken. Uh, it doesn't seem to me that we sitting here in the United States can tell the Palestinians uh, what they ought to do. The framework has to be self-determination. And if Hamas in its political wing is part of that, that's the way Ireland got to a certain kind of, of peace. So, enough. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mitchell. And uh, last but not least, uh, Marilyn. I think um, uh, many of us have looked with dismay as the left parties in Israel have gotten less and less effective and have less and less influence. And the current government is just horrendous. Um, and, and what it's doing to giving settlers permission to be violent towards Palestinians in the West Bank without interference is, is just horrendous. Um, I, I think it's important to, um, to recognize, uh, I do see that there are military, there's a military government in the West Bank. And it's, uh, I was, uh, when I was visiting last year, we could go from, there are, there are three sections, A, B, and C. And we could go to each of them, but our Israeli-Palestinian guide had to leave us for part of the trip because she wasn't allowed into, um, I forget which sector it was, but. Um, and in terms of the Nakba, I think the thing that was driven home the, the most to me by this trip to, to Palestine was that the everyday Israeli doesn't know about the difficulty of Palestinians in the West Bank. I have no direct experience with Gaza Palestinians. The, the, the um, consequences of the wall, the difficulties, that they ha difficulties they have going through security. Um, they have no idea and they don't care that they have no idea. And that was, it kind of reminded me of the way that for um, most of the um, existence of this country that whites have been able to ignore the oppression of people of color and not care about it and perpetuate it and um, not do anything about it. At the same time, I don't think what's unfolding in, in Gaza is genocide. I really don't. I think genocide, um, I, I really think that the Israeli military forces are not being indiscriminate. I think they are trying to hit Hamas. 
Now, that doesn't say that that justifies the amount, the number of civilians that have died. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying I don't, I would not classify it as genocide. I think of genocide as what happened during the Holocaust, Rwanda, the Cambodian killing fields. To me, that's genocide. This is not there, and I hope we don't have to add the word yet as you did, Professor Mitchell. Well, I say that's um, ethnic cleansing. Though. Yeah, yeah. Do you agree that it's ethnic cleansing? Uh, to move the population from, uh, from one area to the other, I thought was, it is, they were trying to get Hamas. I didn't see it. I have to think about that one. Okay. I mean, Israel is documented as systematically targeting Excuse me, it's and... still my turn to talk. Um, and uh, Bernard, when you said that Israel is the foundation of Palestinian oppression, I will get The foundation at, to, of Israel. What? The foundation of Israel was, yeah, it's... It, no, I think it goes back to the British after um, World War II, before the foundation of Israel. Um, and, and did I have anything else I needed to say? Uh, the Israel bombing of Lebanon was in response to rockets from Hezbollah. Okay. Thanks for all the panelists for their remarks. Uh, now we're moving to the Q&A session. Uh, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand and I'll give it to you. Uh, we prefer questions rather than statements and try to keep your questions short, around two minutes. have statements. There's a lot of stuff that was here. People should have statements. There's a lot of stuff here. Uh, well, for our panel format, we prefer questions. Thank you. Thank you for that panel. Um, I guess just taking as a point of departure something that uh, Professor Mitchell said, that he says um, perhaps now political lines must be quote-unquote improvised and quote-unquote made up on the fly. And I guess as somebody that's been on the left now for 17, 18 years, I think that what happens when things are made up on the fly is that the entire history of the left comes swarming back and everyone starts actually speaking in these terms. So in that spirit, just kind of raising this problem of history in the room, which was raised in the different ways in the panelists, if you allow me to kind of raise it. Um, one way is through Bernard Trotsky and Lenin, and I guess I have a question about the ways in which the Second International dealt with the question of decolonization. You know, students are learning about decolonization today. It's an old problem on the left, isn't it? And there were different ways of dealing with this question. There was a difference between Lenin and Wilson and the questions of self-determination. What does the left teach us about that period? Um, I thought that this question of the Marxist guerrilla warfare movements versus um, the Western Marxist terms, I was wondering, Hassan, if you could explain what you mean about like that particular difference and that history, um, and why is it that um, these two things are they part of one history? Are the kind of, are the Marxist guerrilla movements and the Western Marxist tradition are they part of a larger history? Are they categorically opposed? And if so, why and, and how? Certainly Hamas was not guided by Bakunin, but um, their roots were in al-Shariati and the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And that history, I think, would be important to recognize to try to understand why is it that they were the last men, the last men standing. Last, um, I think that it's curious for many of our um, audience, perhaps not a couple, of the question of um, Zionist socialism and what, is, what does that mean? I think that that's very odd to many of us and I was hoping that you could tell us what that meant during this period of the new left and what's this um, balance that, that you had to walk in trying to raise that question. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, now the panelists, uh, feel free to respond in whatever order. I mean, some questions were directly specified to certain panelists. Uh, Oh, okay, well, the second international was the, oh, you need it? Oh, oh, uh, <laughs> okay, well, the second international was the, uh, was the organization uh, that betrayed the, um, the working class during uh, World War I 
where they supported the different, the different and varied uh, social democratic parties supported their own bourgeoisie and their uh, own capitalist class in an in, 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 in imperialist war. Now you're talking about the third international of Lenin and Trotsky. Is that the question you have? Lenin versus uh, Wilson. Wilson was the uh, president of U.S. imperialism. Wilson was the uh, was the uh, the uh, uh, president of uh, of the imperialist beast that was uh, growing and actually uh, began its ascent uh, coming out of that war when the other parties uh, had gotten weaker. Now, Lenin was a revolutionary who led the, um, led the Russian working class. There's many different nationalities to take power, to overthrow the rule of, um, of the bosses and the landlords and, and, the, and, the, uh, and the war makers, the, the imperialist war makers. You know? They're the difference. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know if the, the decolonization question was addressed to me, but I largely agree that um, with Bernard that Wilson Wilson adopted the language of self-determination as a way of co-opting the radical demands behind what it meant because there was a fear that the decolonizing countries would turn towards Leninism um, and yeah Wilson was the president who screened birth of the nation in the, in the White House um, with regard to the question about Marxist guerrilla movements, I, I want to emphasize that my main point is that there are Marxist traditions in the third world um, that cannot be understood by simply um, dropping categories like the proletariat and the work and the you know the working class and the capitalist. All, as important as those categories are, there's a qualitative difference between uh, uh, a person living in Gaza where there's 70% unemployment, and a uh, worker in Israel. Uh, that's where the, the analysis of settler colonialism is important. Fundamentally, yes, capitalism is the key contradiction. But there, there, these different Marxist movements that are indigenous, these third world Marxist uh, movements, deal with those questions in a specific way, including the question of religion, which is not a question that can be universally answered in, in all circumstances with one formula. Um, and I think, yeah, they, like, they, a lot of the, the particular questions have to, like, the Today Party has to do with the um, history of relations between Iran and Russia, which are geographically close to each other. Um, and, like, the reasons that it became, it took the positions that it did in, in contrast to a younger generation. I think, like, there is a lot of diversity. In particular, Arab Marxism uh, grew, out, grew out of um, a bath, like a, a critique of Baathism, like Syrian Baathism, Iraqi Baathism and a, a critique of um, um, pan, just generally pan-Arab pan -Arab, uh, movements. Uh, that's, just, uh, that's just like a, a brief way of saying that it's complex. And I think these traditions need to be respected enough to read, read the people who wrote the, the works on an equal footing. Yeah, and my reference to Bakunin is partly uh, uh, humorous, uh, if it's possible to make jokes at this time. Uh, and and uh, I want to associate myself with Hassan's remarks that you cannot simply uh, lay on the principles of Marxist-Leninism as if they, uh, they can apply independently of cultural, religious, uh, historical issues that make these liberation movements, decolonization processes, uh, often very, very different. Um, and that's why I think improvisation is, uh, it's always going to be uh, the work of historical action, of political action, uh, finding coalitions, finding ways through the labyrinth of false choices, many different ways to go wrong. To me, the, uh, the Israelis have just suffered a major defeat and sometimes it's good for a country to suffer a defeat. This is also a defeat. Uh, you remember, Israel was in a civil on the verge of a civil war throughout this year. If it hadn't been for October seventh, uh, we were looking forward to the moment when the Netanyahu regime would have collapsed. 
uh, as I We're hope it looking. soon will, uh, it, 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 how this man can stay in power uh, is a total mystery to me. Uh, it's just the entropy of uh, fast-moving events. So this is what I think any war, and we don't need to call this a war, it's certainly uh, the, the breakout of Hamas, I think, succeeded beyond their wildest expectations. I don't think they expected Israel to be so undefended. Uh, I imagine a very high percentage of the uh, Hamas fighters <coughs> expected it to be a suicide mission. But it was, and military historians are going to be studying what they did, and people who want to support insurgency are going to be looking at it because it was a brilliant military operation. And I think insofar as it was atrocious and brutal and horrific, uh, on the one hand, it may be that Hamas wanted to do that in order to shock Israel, to say, this is how much we despise you. But th that has also been a subject of Netanyahu's propaganda. He's the one who's been exaggerating the brutality. Uh, we're going to find out a lot in the coming days about how the, uh, the prisoners, the hostages, have been taken care of. And a, a moment of truth is about to arrive when uh, the IDF captives uh, will be uh, ransomed. The price for, the, for soldiers, they are not hostages, they are prisoners of war from Hamas's point of view. So that's going to be a rather different uh, kind of look. Uh, so, sorry, I don't have a guiding star, uh, a red star or any other to, to guide me through this, but uh, intelligent people are going to have to improvise, and uh, I, I hope we'll be thinking collectively about how to do that. To answer your question about social Zionism, socialist Zionism, uh, is the, was the ideology that uh, Israel should be a place of Jewish self-determination as well as a socialist society. And that it was very important to be an agrarian society where Jews were working the land, Jews were part of the proletariat, um, and that was the basis of the, um, the Labor Party and um, though and parties left of the Labor Party within Israel, and I don't know, Mikhail, if you have something more to add to that because it's not my forte. <laughs> no. Uh, okay. May I follow up on that though, Marilee? Uh, I feel like part of the reason why the question was asked is because something like social Zionism seems like a total contradiction from the perspective of today's yeah. left. So yeah. I'm wondering why you think that no, from the seventies we move. Uh, first of all. In Europe, for centuries, Jews were denied being able to own land. They were denied being able to have certain jobs, certain professions. Um, so the idea of having a place of refuge where Jews could take part in all parts of society. They could be the policemen. They could be the, uh, the farmers. Um, they could be the garbage collectors. What, whatever it was could be done by Jewish workers in a place of self-determination because the oppression in Europe was so great that there wasn't room for that. Right, but my question was uh, about why I feel like your perspective of a socialist Zionism is very much not part of the left at the moment. Uh, could you speak to that? Why from the 70s to today? this tendency of social Zionism seems much less prevalent? Um, it, well, it just seems that Israel itself has moved on and become much more capitalist. Um, many of the kibbutzim have, you know, the kibbutzim used to be um, owned by everyone in the kibbutz and they've, they've sold off houses. I mean, I, uh, friends of my son live in a kibbutz where they bought a house. They're not members of the kibbutz, they bought a house there. Um, so that whole era of, of a strong 
vision of socialism seems to have faded. Uh, does that answer your question? Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it does. Uh, next, we'll move on to another question. I think you saw you raise your hand earlier. Um, thank you all. Uh, I have a question uh, sort of about the framing of the event and the conversation. Um, I would like to direct it, if possible, just to the first three panelists, um, because I don't, I don't know how to put it politely, but genocide denial and Zionist apologetics of the sort that Merit Lee's putting forward are not part of the conversation that I want to have, um, particularly as this genocide is happening. Um, the question is about, uh, so the event is titled Left Perspectives. Um, on Israel-Palestine, and I want to it, wonder if you all could talk a bit about um, what is gained and what is lost by having the conversation um, as the left, meaning self-consciously thinking about what are we doing as the left, what, how do we analyze this as the left, rather than, for example, thinking about our position as US citizens. Um, and it seems to me that there are two kind of extremes represented by uh, Bernard and Professor Mitchell. Um, Bernard's being, I don't want to caricature your position, but it seems to me that uh, he has a stronger confidence in the left sort of power as a movement, and for that reason feels comfortable dictating strategy, uh, solutions, methods, and so forth to the Palestinians um, without consultation. Um, Professor Mitchell seems to think that the left is in a more powerless position, which is a sentiment I share, and for that reason has expressed you know, a lack of clear guidance and a need for improvisation and things like that. But I wonder if it might be possible to instead frame the conversation as uh, around the question of, as US citizens, what is our basic um, responsibility living in the sort of imperial metropole to a population in whose genocide, in whose ethnic cleansing, in whose erasure, uh, we have a direct hand, whether we chose it or not. Um, and how might that inform the way that we, yes, engage in theory, we think through our own analysis, and that, that plays a certain role, but at the end of the day, there's always a measure of accountability concretely to the people, even if we don't like all their tactics, even if we think BDS is foolhardy, um, at some level, is there not a place for recognizing that that's the Palestinians' decision to make? Same thing goes for armed resistance. Um, uh, there, there's a you know, wide spectrum of opinion among Palestinian leaders, activists, and so forth about the utility of armed resistance in certain circumstances and so forth. There's disagreements within that national community, uh, but at the end of the day, I think there are times when, while applying critical analysis, while applying certain moral measures of consistency, there's a place to, for saying, it's my responsibility as a US citizen to at least be representing aspects of the kind of resistance Palestinians have elected to engage in that are otherwise not heard. Um, and it's my responsibility to accent the things that are not heard about the decision that Palestinians make, rather than either looking for improvisational strategies just in the domestic US front, or dictating solutions to Palestinians um, from the domestic US front. I hope that makes sense. Thanks. Thank you for the question. Uh, the palace are free to respond whatever order. Uh, Bernard, would you like to respond? Um, uh, could you use the microphone? Yeah, just, just very briefly, because I think the other people in the uh, audience should, should, actually, should actually speak as well, uh, have the opportunity. Um, our statement, um, a revolutionary road to Palestinian freedom, only death and defeat with Hamas, Liberal outrage won't stop Gaza massacre. Those aren't dictations, those are arguments that you make and you seek to win. Uh, would uh, Professor Mitchell or Hassan, would you like to respond? Go ahead, Go ahead Hassan, if you will. No, no, I think. Um, I think we are, uh, the sentiments you're expressing are very close to my own. Uh, that is, I think about my responsibility as a U.S. citizen, and the reason I signed up for BDS, for all that uh, the effect it had, uh, was that an America, I feel the U.S. should not be supporting this client state uh, 
Joe Biden just announced today that he's opening our arsenals, which are uh, under lock and key inside Israel, uh, uh, to give them more ordinance for mass killing. Um, so it, it, I think it's responsibility of US citizens now to express horror at uh, what is happening in, in Gaza. Uh, I have to say I was equally horrified and shocked on October 7th. It took me uh, weeks, really, to kind of get my bearings after that. Because I have had, uh, and again, this is personal for me. Uh, I've had so many crucial friendships in my life over a long time. Going back to the moment of Jewish socialism, uh, where I shared this feeling that yes, something uh, wonderful and just has happened here. Uh, at the same time, of course, uh, <laughs> my conversation with a member of Mossad kind of uh, put a little damper on that. Oh, so this is going to be a socialist Jewish state. How wonderful. And uh, that means everybody will be equal, including non-Jews? Mm, well, maybe not. Uh, so yeah, it, and Benny made that clear when he said, you know, we've taken their land, we're not going to give it back. And the, the other thing about Jewish socialism, uh, I was one of those who ha happily joined in the uh, kind of agrarian dream of the kibbutzim. And that's part of the horror of October 7th, was it was these, the, the kibbutzim. Uh, but of course, a lot of the uh, residents of Gaza uh, uh, had that land, owned that land before. They are exiles from that land. So the kibbutzim are looking, another key word in all of this is the word innocent. You know, are Americans uh, innocent? No, we're not. Uh, we're responsible for our government. We have self-determination. Uh, at least we have so far. Uh, next November we may be saying goodbye to that. <coughs> Uh, so, uh, this is why I, I don't feel any kind of uh, solid foundation in Marxist thought for uh, sorting all of this out. I'm much more uh, in that position of saying the Palestinians, uh, a framework has to be created in which the Palestinians can determine their own future and not have it dictated by anybody's dogma, uh, and especially not by the U.S. But we will have to be part of that, and I think it's every American citizen's uh, responsibility to try to encourage that to happen. Uh, I'm so happy to see the White House staff rising up <laughs> inside the White House to tell Joe Biden, you have to send a message to Netanyahu, this is over, can't go on. And maybe the pause uh, in the killing will lead him to say that more emphatically. I hope so. Uh, yeah, I think I think the importance of Marxism or leftism is in that it can give an analysis to understand how the Palestinian question is a universal question in a concrete way. So um, we can say that uh, nobody will be free until Palestinians are free, which is true. Um, but Marxism can show why, um, well, ideally, it can show um, why the interests are arranged in such a way as to make that freedom impossible and what nodes need to be attacked, first and foremost, US imperialism. Um, but I agree that um, discussion is good, but there is a, a baseline that we can agree on, Un unless we approach into Zionism. There's a baseline we can agree on, which is that um, targeting, systematically targeting health centers and declaring a population of people human animals and arming mixed cities with machine guns to carry out vigilante violence is something that anybody respectable needs to materially take a stand against. Uh, Marley, actually, would you like to respond to anything that's just been said, or to the question as well? Uh, I, I just uh, wanted to say that um, I agreed with that last thing that you said. I thought that was very powerful. That's all.
Thank you. Um, now we're moving on. Um, yeah, I'm with the Spartacus League also. And I wanted to, to say a few words for people to respond to, which um, to say that we, like to put this as terms of dictate, like we, to not put forward a program to hammer out and argue about is an abdication of leadership. It's guilty liberalism. And that <clears throat> there have been all kinds of opportunities since the Russian Revolution, since all of these things, the problem has been a crisis of leadership, of revolutionary leadership. Marxist Leninism means working class power. Um, and you, you, we talk about the Russian Revolution because Russia, under the Tsar, was a prison house of nations. Lenin and Trotsky liberated the nationalities in that country. We can talk later about the degeneration under Stalin, which is another question. So that brings us to, to, I would love to talk to you more about the left and Marxist-Leninism in the mid Middle East, Near East, because there is a tradition, and we repudiate those com communist parties under Stalin because of the program of class collaboration and guerrillaism has proven to be a failure. Um, so let me say a few things about making an analogy to why we say, let me back up a minute. Because I heard at one point, I think you said, you, in principle, you're in favor of the block, blocking, co collaborating with the Israeli working class, but now is not the time. Now is the time. Because if, just because revolution is not happening tomorrow does not mean you cannot put forward a revolutionary strategy today to win people to, to pat, chart a path forward. So yes, Palestine is the Zionist state, the foundation of the Zionist state is Palestinian oppression. I'll give you an analogy. U.S. capitalism, U.S. imperialism, foundation of U.S. imperialism is a foundation of, of black oppression. Labor cannot be free in the white skin while branded in the black. Israeli working class will not be free when there's Palestinian oppression. And so that is our point. The question today, what is posed today, is to break with liberalism, break with class collaboration, and that it's all a question of good thoughts and align with the imperialists who are the oppressors. The butchers will not stop butchering. We need an independent, multiracial, revolutionary party here and internationally. So to break with liberalism and stop shackling the working class and the oppressed to their, to their masters or their respective oppressors. So I would say I'm happy to, to talk more about this with anyone, as is Bernard, and sit down. We have some publications to read about, but if you don't make that break and argue for the path forward today, there will never be a socialist Middle East, United States, Europe, et cetera. Very, very like, briefly. Uh, may I, I just like try to um, add something to that question, if you don't mind, like, which links back to our general discussion. Um, do the powers agree that the task today is to break with liberalism? And also, what type of opportunity is this current crisis for the left? Is this current crisis an opportunity for the left? And if so, uh, what kind of opportunity? Um, very briefly, I just wanted to say, I think the place in the statement where there is an element of dictation I agree that there needs to be a, a position put forward strongly that can be followed and uh, that isn't um, liberal. However, when you say um, only death and destruction with Hamas, or you uh, say uh, Middle Eastern parties are, the Middle Eastern Communist parties, the tradition can be explained in terms of Stalinism, class collaborationism, and guerrilla warfare. Uh, that is very dismissive. Uh, and it's, in, in the particular case of Hamas, it's in direct contradiction to the expressed uh, uh, political affiliations of many Palestinians. It's, it's in contradiction to the way that many Palestinians understand resistance. So there needs to be a, a, an engagement with Hamas. There needs to be, an, but not particularly Hamas from my perspective, there needs to be an engagement with uh, resistance groups 
that are originate in the Middle East on their terms and not simply in terms of Western Marxism. And I don't think they can at all be reduced to Stalinism, class collaborationism, and guerrilla warfare. I think that's very reductive. Would anyone else like to respond? Yes, I would. Um, I, I, you can break with liberalism all you want. I'm sure you'll uh, find a few allies out there. Uh, but I think this is a moment uh, for alliances between what's left of the left and uh, the, the, the liberals, if only uh, in pursuit of the, the tradition of liberal democracy, the idea that uh, self-determination involves things like elections and majorities and honest vote counting and uh, the will of the people being expressed. It does not depend on uh, th theories delivered ex cathedra about uh, how the Israeli working class uh, needs to be mobilized. Uh, dream on. I just don't see it. Uh, I think if you uh, knew anybody in the Israeli working class, they would. Uh, I think Benny Dadush uh, spoke for them when he said, we're, We've taken their land and we're not going to give it back because we want to be farmers too. In fact, we were farmers before they arrived. And the whole agrarian socialist side of uh, the, uh, the early Zionism uh, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, we need to remember that that uh, uh, greening of Israel uh, involved planting forests. I think we contributed also to Trees for Israel. And the basic point of Trees for Israel was to cover up those Palestinian villages, hundreds of them, that had been depopulated, driven out in ethnic cleansing in the Nakba of 1948. So, uh, you can try to rouse up the working classes all you want. Uh, I think uh, there are better strategies. Would anyone else like to, Bernard or Marley? Um, I, I wanted to speak to what you said about democracy, because I feel like there's a dearth of leadership in Israel, in the PA, and in Hamas. I don't feel like anyone is addressing the needs of the people. I don't think any of those governments are. And so you don't, I mean, I don't know what you do with that. But I'm just saying there is no democracy. And we're here, we are, you know, on the verge of, we're teetering with our democracy. So it's, uh, it's, a, serious, it's a serious liberal problem that we're all dealing with. Yeah. If we need to break with anybody right now, it's with the fascists. Uh, and we, we have one major party in this country that has become, quite technically, in the hands of the fascists. And that's what we need to break with, uh, not with liberalism. Bernard, would you like to respond? A couple of, couple of things. Genocide Joe is not in Trump's party. OK? No. <laughs> well, um, yes a couple no. of things. Um, yeah, the point about, oh, first of all, to even conceive that a discussion with a Mossad agent is speaking, you're, that you're talking to the Israeli working class, that's like saying you're going to take Chauvin, the guy who murdered Floyd, George Floyd, that's representative of the white working class. These are part of this, this, this is part of the state machinery of repression that, 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 that the uh, capitalist uh, class uh, runs. Now, I'm not saying that there are, I'm, no, the point, that's the whole point about the argument. Because you see what happens in the consciousness that is right now. And you have to make an argument to change that. And you have to show the road forward. And a lot of this stuff in this country is, in fact, the fight against liberalism. Because you have, we, we, we see it in every, we see it all throughout the, 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 the Gaza tragedy. That what is the solution? What's put forward? What's put forward is not a strategy for the, for the smashing of the Zionist state. 
and going forward on a revolutionary basis of the Israeli and a Palestinian population on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an egalitarian socialist basis. That is not talked about. What is, oh, how bad, who this is, this is, this is, Netanyahu is bad and everything else, and, and all those things may be true. But, to, but to, the, the, thing, the, the last thing that uh, you said about uh, all these, you know, that Hamas and the, and the PA and the Israeli government, Hamas and the PA operate within the context of a hideously re uh, oppressed population by the Israeli government, backed by imperialism. So let's get rid of all that stuff about trying to make e e equals, okay? Our fight with Hamas, and we would join, we would join militarily with Hamas if it had if it, if, at legitimate targets, like the Mossad and the IDF. On a military basis, we would not lower our communist banner in opposition to narrow. I mean, the thing about religion and stuff that, who cares? Most people made, most of the guys who made the Russian Revolution believed in God. Okay? But there was a program there. There was a party in the program that led the working class and the soldiers and fought for the peasantry. And that's kind of like what, what, what we need. We need a revolutionary program to mobilize the working masses, both proletarian and agrarian. What you cannot do is fall into the trap of relying on one wing or the other of the imperialist beast that has shown you again, again, again that they don't give a damn about the Palestinians if you press, as, as the oppressed as the oppressed nationality. That's the problem. That's the fight against liberalism. That's the obstacle. That's the smoke screen that, 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 that blocks the, the, the clear road of what is necessary. And what is possible changes, depending on the level of struggle. You get enough struggle, a little bit more is possible. And that is our perspective. But again, our program will be put forward, organize the anti-imperialist struggle on a revolutionary Marxist basis. That is the only way forward. Because we've seen the others have been, have been around. Pax Americana has been around. The Islamic struggle has been around. Those are, those are not successful. Those have not been successful. They have come up and, and taken over leadership after you had a situation where the, where the punitive Marxist betrayed the working class and, and, and the peasantry by subordinating their political program to the nationalists. Sorry, Bernard, okay. I have to. Uh, okay. uh, just for one last, uh, we're going for one last question. Uh, also, we're, yeah, I, I'm aware we're running. We'll run a bit over, uh, and that's okay. Thank you. Oh, this is a question for you, uh, Ravi Maroli. Did I spell her name right? I'm sorry, what? Did I spell her name right? Maroli? Yes, yeah. Maroli right. Golden. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I read from a profile that you declared yourself as a feminist and, uh, and published a magazine called Let's Through Was that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So how do you view um, the, c um, the collective silence on the left on what happened to Jewish women on October 7th? Um, they either, many of them said that the, um, like the, the Alberta University Sexual Assault Council, Council they sent um, an open letter which claimed that the fact that um, the accusation that Hamas violently raped, mutilated, and dis uh, dismembered civilian women, many of them are all foreign nationals, are unverified and did not actually happen. So as a Jewish feminist, how do you view this? Um, Feel leftist, and many of them are even self-declared feminists. Silent um, on this matter. Thank you for your question. There's so much disinformation that I I don't know what I haven't kept track of what has been verified and. One person, one side verifies something, the other side says, no, they're making that up. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. But I mean, I have seen um, reactions from Jewish feminists that uh, Jewish women's bodies don't matter. A Jewish woman is raped, 
it's not considered rape. It's considered an act of war. So, I mean, I've seen that reaction, I, but I haven't, I don't know. I don't know what's been verified. I don't, I don't know how everybody died. I don't know what else to say. On that point, though, I would recommend that you read a, a look up Max Blumenthal, uh, editor of Haaretz, who uh, in the post-October 7th period did a review of uh, the damage to the kibbutzim and the claims of rape and brutality and the beheading of children. There's a lot of disinformation. Max, uh, I would recommend reading Max Blumenthal. This is in our end. It is disinformation on both sides. Yes, All absolutely. That's right. Yeah, All it's a propaganda. Including Max Blumenthal, and just speaking as a Jew, I'm horrified. And uh, I'm not sure that this, what I'm about to say, belongs to the title of this thing. But I'm horrified by the left response to anti-Semitism, completely ignoring history, so you, you cite uh, Lenin and Trotsky, and Lenin was the first was talking about what anti-Semitism meant in the 19th and the early 20th century, and it's still here today, and now carried by the left with people like that person on the, over there that told, I want to hear the others, I don't want to hear from the rabbi, because we, we don't have to, Zionists don't matter. This is what's going on. And I, as far as I'm concerned, I, I was asked to speak here, maybe to do something, and maybe talk with, with, with Rabbi Gordon here. My point is, it's horrifying. And there is no left if it continues with this disregard to a whole history of anti-Semitism. This, it's here now. And when people talk about Palestine free from the river to the sea, which used to be the revisionists, the ultra-fascist Zionist side of, of this conflict, it's now turned completely upside down. And it's OK, because guess what? Eliminating Jews, you people, is, is just part of history, left, right, or anything in between. And I'm saying, this is horrible. There is not going to be any left if it continues with that kind of attitude. It's about attitude. And nationalism, Palestinian nationalism, is not any better than Zionism or any nationalism, Hungarian, Polish, or whatever kind. They are all uh, in, uh, should be uh, condemned because they are the end of, 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 of history. That's the epoch time. It's over because people are losing their mind, including what's supposed to be the left. What is this coin? Palestine, Palestine, that's nationalist, murderous blood lust from forever to continue forever. Sorry, there's no, uh, there's no future in that. Sorry to cut you short, but, sorry, but also I mean, perhaps to turn it. Because I couldn't just sit here and take it off. Thank you. Perhaps to turn this into a question. I'm just wondering what the panelists think about uh, the question of anti-Semitism. I also like to hear from Bernard what was brought up about uh, Lenin and Trotsky on anti-Semitism. Um, in the Russian Revolution. Um, and I think we might go a bit over. Um, I don't know if that's, Bernard, is that okay? Or is that okay with the other panelists? Oh, we might go 15 to 20 minutes over. Because um, I, like, I feel like we do have some more questions that we have to get to. So um, just to turn that more into a question, the question of anti-Semitism, how should the left respond to anti-Semitism, but also this history on the left of addressing anti-Semitism. Um, how should we think of that history today? Uh, feel free to as um, Okay, I think yeah, I think anybody who considers themselves a leftist and hears about um, uh, rape, sexual assault, um, dismemberment, attacks on civilians that are credible and verified should unconditionally condemn them, uh, condemn the acts. To be clear. Uh, and there is some evidence that, there is credible evidence that Hamas committed atrocities on his attack on October 7th. Uh, and it's not clear the extent of those atrocities. It's not clear the specific type of those atrocities. But we know that uh, certain uh, images 
uh, imi- uh, certain elements of imagery, like the imagery of beheaded babies, uh, has been used cynically and in a dishonest way by the, Zion, the, the, the Israeli government and by Joe Biden in order to discredit Palestinian resistance as a whole. How is that speaking to anti-Semitism? I'll speak to that too. I was, I was answering uh, the first question. I was not mentioning about... Sorry, can we... No responses. No response. Yeah, so I, I, what I would say is that if there, like, to the extent that there is strong, credible evidence that such things happen, it's absolutely wrong for a leftist to sit and say it was justified. That's what I would say about that. Um, to the point about anti-Semitism, yes, anti-Semitism does exist in the United States. Uh, it does exist in Europe. And it does exist among uh, Palestinian factions. However, it's not. Um, it also exists among Zionists, uh, and it's uh, it's not a phenomenon that can be equated uh, in 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 uh, in a uniform way among a Palestinian. Uh, fighter in Gaza with a neo-Nazi in the United States. These are absolutely different positions. Both anti-Semitism in both cases is wrong. But uh, also to say that uh, from the river to the sea is uh, inherently an anti-Semitic claim is I think also wrong. And, uh, and to equate that with an anti-Semite calling for the expulsion or extermination or genocide of Jews is also absolutely wrong. Uh, Many Palestinians uh, believe, and many of their advocates believe, that from the river to the sea is a call for a single, binational, uh, single democratic state. And yes, that is a, I mean, there are Palestinian nationalists also. But the, again, that nationalism is not equal to the nationalism of Zionism because uh, it's operating in the context of settler, settler colonialism and apartheid. Yes. When there is a single unitary democratic state that's not an apartheid state, that is not the full. That is not a revolution. That is not fully revolutionary. But that is much like that is much uh, to be desired over an apartheid system. And and uh, uh, the Palestinian movement is calling for an end to apartheid. It's not calling for extermination of Jewish people or uh, expulsion of Jewish people. Um, so that's what I would say. Would anyone else like to respond? Yeah, I'd just like to add that uh, anti-Semitism uh, and anti-Zionism are not the same thing. Uh, I think it's the, the confusion of the two, the uh, effort to make any criticism of Israel, to transcode it as anti-Semitism, is propaganda. Uh, I'm anti-Zionist. Um, I think it's very be very difficult to accuse me of anti-Semitism. I'm too much uh, aligned with and intermarried with and uh, uh, in deep emotional sympathy with the aspirations of the Jewish people. I was part of that euphoria in the 60s and 70s when we thought something like historical justice was being done. It's been tragic to me to watch the way uh, the Israeli left uh, like the American left, has withered away. Uh, but don't confuse anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. One other thing, look at Christian anti-Semitism, and, uh, which is philo-Zionism, uh, that is pro-Zionist Christians who uh, regard the Jews as part of their divine history. This is what they, the current leader of the House Republicans believes. This is a fixed dogma with white nationalist Christian fascists in this country. This is what Donald Trump will do when he's reelected next fall. So uh, Zionism, anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism, not the same thing. I would argue the opposite. I would say that very often people hide their anti-Semitism by labeling it anti-Zionism. And it's not that they're coming from a position of wanting a one-state solution. It's coming from an anti-Jewish position. So I I think um, 
The problem, and one problem is we don't, we don't really define Zionism in the same way from person to person. So it's hard to say whether somebody who says they're anti-Zionist is truly, truly what? Truly against the state of Israel? Against there being a Jewish state? I would call that. I think Israel has a right to exist. I said if that. If Israel has a right to, to exist, then what does it mean to be anti-Zionist? I'm not asking that question yet. I'm just saying that's kind of a rhetorical question. But, I mean, I, I think anti-Semitism started with Christianity and certainly was much more virulent and destructive and uh, then uh, anti-Semitism in uh, Islamic countries, but we saw that once Israel was established as a state, how Jews in Arab countries who had had fairly um, equal existence with their neighbors, maybe not totally, um, how that changed and how there was a, a, a great exodus of Jews from Arab countries because because Arab countries were equating Judaism with Zionism. Um, and I, I think we underestimate the amount of anti-Semitism, the amount of Jewish stereotypes that we have in our country and, and in the world. Uh, I, I pointed out one example from the United Nations of which there's been um, myriad over the years. And uh, the thing that, that keeps coming back to haunt me is the reaction to Israeli athletes being massacred at the Munich Olympics. How little reaction there was by anyone. It was like, okay, the games went on, no one, no one was, there, there was so little outside of the Jewish uh, community who was horrified by this. Um, I don't know that I want to say anything else. Uh, Bernard, would you like a comment, uh, particularly also about the allusion to Lenin and Trotsky's uh, experience with anti-Semitism in Russia? Yeah, or well, anything else? <laughs> before uh, Lenin and Trotsky, one of their predecessors, August Babel, described anti-Semitism as a socialism of fools. The social what? The socialism of fools. Hmm. Um, as for the river to the sea, uh, that's, that's what was taken away from the Palestinians, the river to the sea. And lastly, the main thing that uh, I want people here to understand, what Lenin and Trotsky fought, was half-stepping liberalism that kept the bourgeoisie in power. That's what they fought. Along the way, they fought a lot of other stuff. They fought the black hundreds. They fought to defend on Friday evening the Jewish neighborhoods, mobilize the working, the working class to do that. That required a fight in the workers' movement, in the, in the left movement, against liberalism and half-stepping and, and, and social democratic support to your own bourgeoisie. There is no difference between the, 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 the devil, uh, Trump, and the party that he represents, and good old genocide Joe, who was called correctly over on the northwest side a couple weeks ago. There is no difference. Represent the same imperialist class. That is the enemy. They are the enemy when they out and out just, uh, they are the enemy when they fund Israel to, 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 the, to the hilt. And they also, they're also the enemy when they propose Pax Americana. That the nationalist Arabs and the, diff and the different uh, half-stepping Arab misleaders suck up and keep the Palestinians oppressed. Thank you, Bernard. So okay. I want to say one last thing. Sure. Um, as uh, my comrade said, we got literature out there that you can read. You haven't seen it, you need to talk if you want to know what a communist, what a Marxist, Leninist, Trotskyist perspective is. We're going to be around for a while after this thing is over. 
Thank you. Uh, so I think we'll take. Uh, so <coughs> the recent growth in, in focus political emphasis on Israel and Palestine is obviously motivated by Hamas's October 7th attacks. In that sense, this most recent explosion of the focus is motivated initially by Hamas and then Israel's reaction. Of course, the answer to that then is, well, there's a long history that motivates it. Hamas isn't responsible, or it is, depending on the perspective. But I guess the question is motivated by the, the response that there's a long history to this. I think we've been brushing up on it in the panel, but I'd be interested in, in drawing it out more explicitly. And I guess to do that, I'll just repeat one of the sentences from the prompt, which is, what role has the left had in shaping these conditions, whether positively or negatively, I think that history goes even before 1948, so this is a broad question, but what, what it, it, could things have been done differently? I, I assume people don't have like a hopeless determinism. Where have opportunities been, been you know, seized or not that has contributed to this seeming condition of, well, it's, it's Hamas and it's the IDF and it's Hezbollah and, and this is what we're dealing with, because I think that is motivating in, in some way, shape, or form all of the perspectives on the panel. Thank you, and the panelists uh, are free to also combine the answer to this question with like final remarks uh, on the panel. Um, so you're free to go. Could I take up one? Of uh, course. Uh, quite directly, um, there was, I think, uh, a substantial missed opportunity in 1947 and 48. Uh, I recommend Ariella Azale, uh, a film uh, about an hour long called A Civil Alliance. Uh, Azale tracked down what was going on in the villages uh, where uh, the Palestinian elders were meeting with uh, the, the kind of pioneers of the Zionist movement uh, uh, who were moving all over Israel. They had discussions. How are we going to live together? Are we going to live together? Uh, is, are you going to try to drive us all out? Uh, Azalei's film uh, shows that there was another path at that moment, and uh, it, which might have led to what we now call, fondly call a, a one-state solution. Uh, there's a lot of ordinary people on both sides, uh, local political figures, elders, uh, both Jewish and Palestinian, and. Uh, but I think the Zionist movement at that point was saying, no, we need the land, we need to drive them out. So uh, three quarters of a million people were driven out. It was ethnic cleansing. Uh, the, the refugee camps are still there, uh, all over Israel, Palestine. So yes, uh, that would be one example. I think there would be many others, but uh, uh, it, it, if anybody here wants uh, a big stack of films, documentary films about this history, uh, I have them in my office. Happy to loan them out anytime. Thank you. Uh, would anyone else like to respond? Also, to combine it with closing remarks. Sure. Um, I think it's a like, it's it's a big question. So I'll just give like my biased answer based on what I've focused on more, which is um, that uh, a lot of the turn towards. Again, I'm not an expert in this, but this is my understanding based on what I've heard so far. A lot of the turn towards um, Islamist political movements uh, resulted after the Iranian Revolution, which was a revolution against a U.S.-backed monarchy, Mohammad Reza Shah, who systematically repressed the left. Um, now, if the Iranian... With that said, the Iranian Revolution was still uncertain in its character. It, did, it wasn't inevitable that it would turn out to be an Islamist revolution. So I think that's like one place where things could have been different. Um, another place where things could have been different, if we go a little bit further back in history, is that the Zionists could have chosen, I believe it was Uganda? Yeah. If the Zionists had chosen to colonize Uganda, um, or the British government had decided not to because of the many anti-Semites in its cabinet, the anti-Semitism won, won out over the imperialism, then uh, the, 
situation of Palestine would have turned out to be very different. Um, and I think the last thing to keep in mind is that the, the current Arab regimes, the regime in Saudi Arabia, the regime in Egypt, um, Jordan, these are not like, uh, or even the civil war in Syria, these are places where there's a lot of dynamism around the issue of Palestine. And so these, these, these governments don't have a lot of legitimacy. So there is like potential for change in those places. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, because the Palestinian question uh, does run over uh, the uh, imperialist uh, borders. Uh, most Jordanians are Palestinians. I'll tell you that. A um, couple of points. Um, the point you made about the Iranian revolution is extremely important. Because you had a society it, 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 Iran was so locked down that America could do anything, murder, and could not be touched because they were Americans in, in, um, in Iran. That's what, that's what the Iranian population responded to, with such vehemence when they took over the embassy and everything else. The problem is, of course, the Marxist left in Iran, Fedayeen, Ashraf Dagani, Tuda. They saw their role not as taking the, and you had to, during, during, during the overthrow of the Shah, you also had a very active um, mobilization of Arab workers in the south, in the oil fields. All this was, 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 was kindling to light, okay, for workers' power to end the oppression of, 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 uh, of, 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 of people on, who, on the land of all the mi ethnic minorities within Iran that the Shah repressed. That was all a possibility. But we see that was the key question that the, that the left failed on. Ourselves, we failed on it. We did not see the importance of that the, at that point that, that the cause of mass liberation must be led by the, by, the, by the communist vanguard in the working class. We said, down with the Shah, no support to the Mullahs. But everything that, the, but you had to speak to what the Mullahs were speaking to, the national oppression of, of Iran. You had to have your own program to end that. You couldn't just say, well, that's not a, that's not a problem. We, uh, that was our error. We failed on that. Uh, there's a book in Comrades and Enemies that talks about uh, the uh, prior to, to the establishment of Israel. You actually had Arab and Jewish working class uh, mobilizations many times in unity, in, in unison. But what happened was the Hispa group, the labor Zionists, they had a program not of organizing the working class. Their program was to drive the, drive the Arab workers out. That hurt the struggle for working class power. Labor Zionism is based on exclusion of the Arabs. So again, yeah, he's, he's a dude still around. They're, they're corporate, this labor federation. They call strikes and everything else. But that's also in their history. Um, let's see. I think that's about it. I, mean, I think I need. I, I think answer the point, yeah. But yeah, that point that you made about Iran, it was extremely important for people to study. It's extremely important because after that things, it, it, uh, things had changed. But also had to do, of course, the fact that the, uh, um, the Arab nationalists and the Ba'athists, who do not predate uh, Marxism in the, in, in, uh, in, in the Near East, they do not, the Ba'athists do not, but they also failed to defeat imperialism, so people start looking for another answer. And that's kind of like- Desmond, there's somebody in the back row who's been trying to get your attention for a long time. Uh, uh, did you have a question? Yeah, sure, but you can also, I mean. Well, Desmond, would like to respond to this question uh, on this? I want to hear Gabe first. Okay. okay. Well, I just wanted to ask the whole panel to respond to this question of like, 
is there, it seems to me that there's actually quite a lot of agreement on this, the importance of national self-determination, despite the fact that there's plenty of disagreement. So I just kind of wanted to hear what the panel had to say about this agreement. Maybe I, because I sort of disagree with that. <laughs> I, I, I never use self determination. Um, I just think that the Palestinian movement is the progressive force against the apartheid. I don't know if that answers, but I don't see self. I don't see self determination. That's okay. So I guess a different thing, like a different thing, is that I don't think that Israel, Israeli people, and Palestinian people have two distinct sets of rights to self-determination in the land of Israel, in the land of Palestine, historic Palestine. I just think there are basic rights that everybody has, political and economic rights, and that apartheid is an oppressive system that needs to be overthrown. So I don't see actually that Israel, for example, has a right to exist as a Jewish state. I see the right of Jewish Israelis to live in that land I see the right of Palestinians to return, and they, their claims have precedence. But I, I wouldn't put it necessarily in terms of self-determination. Okay, and since I think I'm the liberal on this panel, uh, I'll say something in, in favor of self-determination. By that, I simply mean things like uh, a representative of democracy, uh, the, the forms of uh, liberal jurisprudence, division of powers between the judicial, executive uh, 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 branches and legislative. Um, so to me, the cure uh, for the, the madness and the hate uh, and the outrage on all sides is, uh, I'm sorry to say, a very old liberal solution. It's called democracy. Uh, and that's why when I hear uh, theorists sitting in America uh, telling the Palestinians what they should do, I think we should find a way to ask them what they want. I, I want to recommend uh, the, uh, the writings of a man named Omer Bertov, who's an Israeli, um, former member of the IDF. Uh, you can see his statements if you go to Democracy Now. Uh, uh, Bartov has ar argued for a version of the two-state solution, uh, which is a binational federation in which uh, a partition uh, would occur in which uh, half of the country would be governed under uh, Jewish law, under uh, uh, Israeli, is, law, Israeli law, not Jewish law. <laughs> but you. Israeli law also has something to do, since there are all kinds of special laws for so, uh, re yes. religious Jews. They don't serve in the military. Uh, yes, they do. Many, many other, some of them. Uh, very rare. Uh, in any case, uh, I, I recommend looking at Bertoff's uh, way out of this. A federation in which people could stay where they are, but they would understand uh, if uh, Israelis were living in the part of the country uh, that the Palestinians were governing, uh, they would be subject to Palestinian law and vice versa. Uh, it's, it's the only version of the two-state solution I've ever heard that, that really made any sense. But uh, for a long time I felt uh, Edward Said's answer to this question was uh, a, a single state solution, a democratic state uh, in, in which people had equal rights. Uh, no special rights for ethnicity uh, or religion, just you are a citizen of Israel, Palestine. That would be my utopian dream. I don't think it's going to happen, though. I, I want to say a couple things. First of all, uh, in terms of what the left could have done differently, um, when we talk about socialist Zionism, it, I, I feel it was really important in terms of promoting the working class among the Jewish population in the area. But I think once the State of Israel was established, the Histadrut needed to be serving both Jewish and Arab populations. 
And I also think the government needed to be providing the, the labor government needed to be providing the same infrastructure to Al Arab villages in terms of electricity and, and plumbing and, and whatever else, roads, that they did to Jewish villages. And I think that that, that contributed so much to the inequality of, of Palestinians within Israel. And um, in terms of self-determination, I think um, self-determination is important, but I think we can go too far. Okay, you can say there's Jewish self-determination, you can say there's Palestinian or Arab self-determination, but what happens if within, uh, we see in Israeli society, we see Orthodox Jewish population wanting self-determination or to determine, determine for everybody else. And you see the, I don't want to say secular because they're not secular, but the non-Orthodox Jewish population wanting to have self-determination in, in how they live their lives. And I think there can be a problem in the Palestinian community as well uh, in terms of Christian Palestinians and Muslim Palestinians. So the question is, in, and we see what happened with Europe kind of falling apart because of the want, uh, nationalist, um, different ethnicities wanting their own governments led to federations within Europe falling apart. So I don't know. I don't know about self-determination. I question, you know, at what point do you say, okay, you're the group that can have it, and you're the group that can have it, but you can't divide anymore, or... So, I don't know, I think I'm uh, speaking yeah, to Bernard over here. We're, we'll also go ahead and say, I think we might have to call the panel to a close, so everyone give a round of applause for our speakers.